hello everybody. My name is Louisa and I am one of the organizers of this series of events, A Material World Ritual, alongside my colleague Rembrandt. We are very excited today to welcome Alison Lister, a conservator, to talk to us. Um, first of all, about the wonderful um, tapestry from St. Mary's Guildhall, Coventry, but also about wider textile conservation and her practice. Alison is a UK Institute of Conservation accredited textile conservator with 30 years experience in conservation practice and education. Since 2006, she's been the director and principal conservator at Textile Conservation Limited, an independent conservation studio in Bristol. After studying drawing and painting at the Edinburgh College of Art, Alison trained as a textile conservator at the Textile Conservation Centre Hampton Court Palace. From 1991 to 2001, she worked as a course tutor at the Centre on the postgraduate diploma course, during which time she also gained an advanced diploma in higher education studies from the University of London. Alison is currently undertaking a professional doctorate in heritage at the University of Hertfordshire, researching conservation practice in the private sector, and we're very excited to welcome her today. So, with no further ado, I'll hand over to Alison. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Louisa, for that introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the Warburg Institute for inviting me to contribute to this Materials World um, series. The main focus of my talk today is the large woven tapestry that hangs in St. Mary's Guildhall in the city of Coventry, which has just arrived at my um, conservation studio for conservation treatment. Uh, I apologize for the quality of the image of this tapestry, but as I will explain a bit later, it has been very difficult in the past to acquire clear images of the, of the tapestry and to really to be able to be, examine it in the detail uh, that's required to fully understand its meaning and its message and to be able to ensure that it's preserved uh, in the right way in the longer term. As mentioned in the introduction, I will be be presenting some of the early observations and findings coming out of the conservation process that I hope will inform the future interpretation, presentation and preservation of this very rare and important 500 year old tapestry. But I have to say at the start that it really is very early on in the, in the conservation process and we are just beginning to get some of the details that I hope will feed into this whole um, bigger project about the interpretation. I want to start, however, by describing briefly the work I do as the owner of an independent textile conservation studio, as suggested by the Warburg Institute, who thought this might be of interest to um, the material world audience. I came into textile conservation from a fine art and craft background, partly because of the belief that textiles have great value as material culture. And this quote was passed to me by a tutor during my training, and it really encapsulates that value for me. These are textiles as documents of history. And that value can be very small, very local, very modest in scale, as represented, for example, by this 1919 Scout jumper, obviously homemade, heavily repaired, heavily worn, but pr probably of great value to its owner. And contrasting that with this uh, fine silk woven shirt, uh, believed to have been worn by King Charles I at, at his execution. So as, as an example of a textile that has a very grand, very significant meaning and value um, to a very wide number of people. And for me, both of these things have, have, have value in terms of preservation. My studio, Textile Conservation Limited, um, conserves objects of all different types, all uh, textile objects of all different types. And we provide advice and also practical um, action to owners and custodians of textiles wherever they may be. So we work for museums, historic houses, community groups, military regiments, art galleries, as well as private individuals. And 
The objects themselves cover a very diverse range of materials, techniques, forms, functions, some decorative, some very utilitarian, um, really the entire gamut of, of objects that come under this category of, of textiles. So some are very large, small, three-dimensional, flat, ancient, and increasingly modern. Um, so down at the right-hand side here is a, a sculpture by Louise Bourgeois. So, and we were getting more and more of the 20th and 21st century artists' um, textiles in for um, conservation. Work we do is carried out uh, partly in the conservation studio, obviously where we have all the necessary equipment and materials to do this specialist work, but also we are often out and about carrying out the treatment on site, either because the object is, is fixed to some sort of uh, structure and cannot be removed, or actually the work is needed to be done within that space. Um, and increasingly we are doing the work in front of the public um, as, as an added attraction almost to some institutions. And there's certainly great interest by the public in seeing conservation work taking place. I think it's interesting. It shows a, an element of the care of these objects that is normally behind the scene. I think it helps raise awareness of the need for these objects to be cared for in a certain way in order that they can be preserved for as long as possible. But I also find through engaging with the public that actually it gives them an opportunity to talk about their textile heritage or their interest in textiles and really sort of helps connect, connect them with, uh, with, with the textiles within that setting and to feel that they too have a contribution to make to, to textile heritage. So it feels, it feels very inclusive. Uh, and I always take something away from that experience, something that I have learned. Textiles, as well as coming in many different forms and materials, also exhibit many different condition problems that they have accumulated over time. All organic materials are aging, but they are also subject to certain um, uh, factors, both internal and external, that accelerate that deterioration and result in some what we consider to be negative effects. So for example, there is dust and dirt can build up on the surface. If exposed to light, they will, they will fade. Uh, as the materials age, they become more brittle and may start to break apart or to split. Uh, some of them are also very attractive to insect pests who may nibble away at them, leaving holes and tears. And this process is, is generally ongoing. And if the objects are not fully cared for, it can really happen at a very uh, rapid rate, resulting occasionally in the complete destruction of, of the textile. In order for a conservator to know how to preserve a textile in the right way, it's necessary for them to have certain types of information First of all, they need to understand the composition of the textile, what its materials are, how those materials have been put together, how the materials have then been combined to create the actual artifact. We need to understand about what its condition is now, as, as just described, what the particular problems are, whether those problems are coming from an internal factor, such as a, a dye accelerating the degradation of the fibers, or an external factor such as um, high humidity. We also need to understand about its past life, its origins, when it was made, where it was made, because that is all part of its, its nature. It helps to explain its nature. But also what its current role is. What, what does the owner, custodian, or the audience for this subject actually want from it? So we need to think about the end use of our conservation work. What is going to happen to that textile beyond the conservation treatment? And we obviously need to have uh, conversations or ongoing conversations with, with the owners uh, about the information that we've acquired, about the information that they have. And then, yes, a discussion, an ongoing discussion about the, uh, the, the level of conservation that is needed in this case. 
the process of gathering all that data means that conservators often have very close and frequently extended contact time with an object as illustrated here. We, we are physically very close to the object for many hours, days, weeks, and in the case of tapestry, often for, for years. Working our way through in a very uh, organized and, and detailed way, gathering the information we need. And then when the actual conservation work starts, we are again really closely connected with the artifact. And it really provides an ideal opportunity to, to see, to notice, to analyze information about that textile that perhaps has not been gathered before because no one has had that closeness or that, that amount of time with this artifact. And so conservation is very much an opportunity to um, add to the body of knowledge about an artifact and to, to, to present that information in a way that, that um, helps explain its meaning and, and value. And we are very conscious of that role as, as professionals. So tapestries, if you put Coventry tapestry into Google, you're very likely to receive some information and images about two very different tapestries and they are both here on the slide. On the right is the St. Mary's Guildhall tapestry, which we'll, we'll talk about more uh, shortly. And on the left is the Christ in Glory tapestry in Coventry Cathedral. And the two buildings are very close together, divided by the uh, remains of the original cathedral that was damaged um, during World War II. They are obviously very different in scale, in design, even in materials, but they have some similarities in terms of their, um, their power, their influence, the meaning they have to the people looking at them and the messages that can be taken away. They do, uh, there is a 450 year gap in age between them, however. Um, I'm going to start just briefly by looking at the uh, Christ in Glory tapestry in the, in the cathedral, because I think it may help explain the tapestry technique uh, better. Um, my studio, uh, working in collaboration with another conservation studio, carried out some conservation work on the Christ in Glory tapestry uh, a few years ago, and uh, I have a lot of images that I that I want to be able to present here to help um, explain the tapestry technique. But I will come back to the one in St Mary's Guildhall, shall we? So this tapestry sometimes referred to as the Coventry Tapestry, which is a little confusing, but its full name is actually the Christ in Glory in the Tetramorph Tapestry. And it was designed by the British artist Graham Sutherland in the late 1950s and woven in France in the Aubusson region of France, which has a very long history of tapestry manufacture and still produces tapestries today. It is 23 meters high and 13 meters wide and thought to be the largest continuously woven tapestry in the world. And it really, really is awesome. And I recommend uh, going to see it. Um, it a tapestry was part of the original scheme of the architect of the new Coventry Cathedral, Basil Spence. And he is shown in the picture on the right here, talking to the head of the weaving studio where the tapestry is being made. On the left are the weavers, 13 in total, working on a horizontal tapestry loom. There are both horizontal and vertical tapestry looms um, available, and it isn't always, easy, isn't always possible to tell whether a tapestry has been woven on a vertical or a horizontal if you don't, don't know its background. Um, as you can see from the, the photo of the weavers, uh, they are leaning against a beam and that's where the finished parts of the tapestry are being rolled on as they work the next section. So they work across the full width and up the height of the tapestry. Between the weavers and uh, Basil Spence, there is a, 
uh, Sutherland's uh, original painting of the design for the tapestry. And, uh, but obviously it need, needed to be scaled up hugely in order to reach this 23 meter high uh, size that was um, chosen to entirely fill the nave of the, of the cathedral. The process of tapestry weaving is that an artist or a designer creates the image. Another craftsman comes in and scales up that image into a very large drawing, the size of the finished work that is known as a cartoon. Then that cartoon is passed to the weavers who follow the design of the, uh, of the cartoon. In many cases, the artist is, is unknown. In this case, he is but in the more um, uh, off the shelf tapestries, uh, the artist isn't always known. And certainly the, the cartoon creator is almost never identified. The weavers too are also not always named particularly historically, although the master weaver of the studio, uh, they are sometimes identified and their name is woven into the borders of, of tapestries. So behind this whole tapestry manufacturing um, history, there are a lot of unrecognized, hugely talented individuals um, who, who, who we will never know who they are. Um, but we should bear that in mind, I think, when we were looking at these um, artifacts. I have included in the bottom left some details of feet. Um, there is the original drawing from uh, Sutherland sketches for the tapestry. Uh, you can see the feet of Christ in the tapestry itself and then just a, a, a detail. And the figure that stands between the feet is about five uh, foot high. So give you some, some scale. On the top right, there is a, uh, um, uh, Graham Sutherland standing with a sample that was woven by the weavers. And that sample is actually in the Herbert Museum, which is uh, the museum close to the cathedral. Conservation work that we did um, gave us the opportunity to actually uh, see the full front of the tapestry because it was covered with scaffoldings. We were able to go up the scaffolding and to get behind the tapestry where there is a very narrow walkway every two meters that crosses across the back of the, of the tapestry. Uh, we have to wear some fall arrest equipment because there's nothing between you and a 23 meter uh, drop uh, except for the tapestry. Uh, this, this felt a huge sort of privilege to be able to get this close to the tapestry and we were very close. We vacuumed and wiped the entire surface of the front and, uh, and the back. So we really, really got to know this, got to know the subject. And I think at every time we were just amazed at the quality of the work. Extremely difficult over such a large piece to, to get such even, neat, really, really effective work. And we know from studying the, the uh, uh, Sutherland's information that he had a very particular way he wanted the weavers to work. It really is a very impressive piece of work. Okay, so what I'm doing with these pictures is, is using the uh, images from the Christ and Glory tapestry to explain the technique of, of tapestry. The word is widely used to describe several different techniques these days including embroidery worked on a canvas ground, otherwise known as canvas work or petit point. Um, but that is embroidered work. Um, woven tapestry is, as the name suggests, woven. And the diagram in the center essentially shows the basic technique. So what you have when it's made are the warp threads, which normally run from top to bottom, held under tension and they are normally undyed. And that's because the weft threads that pass over and under the, the warps, but in a much, much looser state are beaten down and completely cover the warps. So the design of tapestry is in the weft only. It is the weft that is creating the tapestry. So it is a weft-faced plain weave material. What's also distinctive about it, though, is that it has discontinuous wefts, which means that the wefts don't run across the entire width of the fabric as they do uh, with uh, the more conventional woven fabrics. They only pass backwards and forwards within the area of the colour. 
and then the next area has a separate separate set of warp uh, sorry separate set of weft passing backwards and forwards and where the two meet a slit can be formed which is sewn up later or the threads from the different sections the wefts from the different section can be connected together to form an, uh, an, an integral join between the blocks of the colour. Contemporary tapestry is wo woven mainly with cotton warps and a whole array of different fibres for wefts. Historical tapestry, certainly in the European tradition, the warps are often undyed wool and the wefts are wool that has been dyed or undyed. Silk is also used and occasionally um, precious metal wrapped threads, gold and silver, um, for extra um, sheen. A further important distinction, though, between historic and modern tapestry is that while during weaving, the warps are positioned so as to run from top to bottom and the wefts from side to side, the image is actually woven on its side, which I hope you can see in this center photograph. The, the, the tapestry, when finished, is turned and then hung in the weft direction. And that's what's shown in the photograph. The, the ribbed effect created by the warps are, is running across the tapestry, not top to bottom as it would have been when it was made. And this is how the St. Mary Guildhall tapestry is woven. Whereas the Christ in Glory tapestry is woven with the warps running uh, vertically, uh, woven and hung with the, with the warps running vertically. The reason it's important to know this is partly because it explains certain elements of the way the design is created, and I will illustrate that shortly. But it's also important in understanding how the tapestries deteriorate over time. One problem in terms of preservation is that with tapestries turned on their side, they are now hanging from their weaker element, the weft, because the weft is traditionally less tightly spun. Uh, and that can lead to just strain overall. It can lead to stretching, so you get distortion, plus actually opening up of the joins between the different colors, particularly if they have been worked as slits that were then stitched up later. The slit stitching, which is often linen, degrades and breaks over time, and that creates more opening up of, of the structure. I'm not going to go into the history of tapestry. I'm not a tapestry historian, um, but as I'm sure many of you are aware, tapestry has a very long and illustrious history all around the world. And um, each part of the world has its own traditions in terms of designs and, and materials. In European um, tapestry, um, as I said before, the, the most common materials used are wool, uh, with silk used particularly as highlight in areas to highlight in sky, in clothing, in plants, for example, and then very occasionally metal, metal wrap threads for, for the, very much the, the top of the range tapestries. The materials and designs and the quality vary greatly. Um, it, this, it was very much an industry at certain periods in the past and uh, there were the, the cheaper end of the market and the more expensive end of the market. And this is often shown by the, the quality of the image, but also by the, the fineness of the weave. And that is usually defined by the number of warps per given um, measurement, um, historically per inch, but now we, we use centimeters. And the quality of the materials used so a, a more expensive tapestry may have a lot more silk in it uh, they may also have a wider range of colors uh, if it's a finer tapestry you can put in a lot more detail so uh, you can create extremely realistic images uh, with with more with, with a finer weave so there's a huge range in terms of of quality the 
tradition of weaving in Europe continues, but is on a very much smaller scale now. There are one or two uh, studios with teams of weavers. Uh, for example, in the bottom right here, this is a set of tapestries designed by the artist John Piper, and these were woven in Namibia in a, in a tapestry weaving studio set up there. Uh, many of you may also know about the Dovecot studio uh, in Edinburgh. Uh, there are many more individual designer makers who will create their own designs and weave their work and um, exhibit and sell and sell their work. So it is it's still um, a craft that is practiced, but, on, but not on the industrial scale that it has been in the past. The St. Mary Guildhall Tapestry um, is believed to have been woven around 1500 to 1520. So is part of this 15th, 16th century period in which certain uh, designs, certain techniques, and as you can see, very much a, a specific color range was very common. Uh, the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Metropolitan Museum both have um, really wonderful collections of um, tapestries from, from this period. And um, they, they offer a huge amount of information, particularly about costume, which is also a useful uh, feature uh, when we come to date tapestries. Although, um, as I will explain, it, it can confuse the issue um, somewhat. Um, England had a small tapestry industry of its own um, that began in the 16th century. Um, it was not a big producer of tapestries. The, the, the most important area, areas were in Flanders. And the St. Mary Guildhall tapestry is believed to have been woven um, in that part of the world. However, there, there was a small um, studio uh, a little bit later on than the date of the tapestry um, called the Sheldon Tapestry Studio. And I mention it partly because uh, a set of map tapestries that were woven at the, at the Sheldon Studios, uh, one of them features Coventry, which I've illustrated here. I think it's really, really charming. And one of the other tapestries in the set uh, has, still has its original borders which stylistically have, have been said to have some sort of connection with a part of the Coventry tapestry that had been has been altered at a later date. Uh, there is a, a, a brief mention of uh, a Sheldon tapestry in, a, in an early discussion about the style of this um, alteration that was, that was made. So I, I mention it for that, for that reason. Tapestry deteriorate in all kinds of ways, uh, as described with other textiles. Uh, so you have fading, you have um, damage caused by insects. You often have loss that's related to the dye, particularly the dark brown, black dyes that were used to create the outlines of main figures during this um, 15th, 16th century period. And once those lines have been lost, the definition of, of the overall image is lessened. Um, so they so it can really affect the, the, um, the quality of the image and, and the reading of the design. Tapestries, many, they survive for hundreds of years, such as the as the Guildhall tapestry. And over that time, they have, re have received some damage, some uh, they deteriorate. And so have been repaired uh, often several times and not always very well. And those repairs can actually also be altering the balance of the design by changing the color, creating textures, putting in patches of other tapestries, um, really unsightly darning and stitching that can just disrupt the whole image. Um, with tapestry, there is has to be the consideration of the, the structural needs of the object and the aesthetic needs of the object, because as with a, a piece of fine art, uh, the image is as important as, as the, the material of the, of, the tap, uh, of the textile, which is not always the case with, with other textiles. 
Um, the treatment of tapestries um, is, is a specialist area within textile conservation. That's partly to do with this need to uh, consider the aesthetic quality of them, uh, but also they tend to be very large, they can be heavy, they take up a lot of space, they need a lot of manpower. Um, the, the general conservation approach is to uh, remove any um, harmful material that the, the tapestries have accumulated over time. Uh, one way of doing that is through cleaning, so we would remove surface dust with vacuuming or, or wiping. They then may be uh, immersion cleaned using a detergent solution. Um, in recent times, uh, a specialist wet cleaning facility has uh, been created in Belgium, in Mechelen, called the DeWitt um, Tapestry Manufactory. Uh, they used to be makers of tapestry and have moved into conservation. And they have um, an extremely effective cleaning method using vacuum suction, which is illustrated in the middle images here. And uh, on the right of the before and after um, it was uh, um, images of an area of a tapestry cleaned using this method. On the bottom left is uh, the water samples that are taken from the cleaning process. And tapestries within the UK are, can become particularly soiled with this black sticky dirt that results from us burning coal for many years. Um, so you really get a very thick black um, uh, dirt coming out when they're cleaned. Second ma major element of the treatment is uh, what we call support, which involves attaching the original tapestry material to new fabrics in order to give them strength and stability to infill visually areas of loss and to give us um, something uh, um, stable and strong in which to secure weak and damaged areas of, of the tapestry. And the tapestry is put on a frame so that you can work across from one side to the other. We would then add a lining to protect against dust and the modern way of hanging tapestries is, is using Velcro. I just wanted to have a quick um, comment about brick couching, which is a, a particular technique used in the conservation of tapestries. Uh, and this was some work done by an ex-colleague of mine from many years ago. Um, if you can see the figure of the deer on the left, I'm then sort of zooming in a little bit, and I hope you can see around the neck of the deer um, where there was originally silk woven into the tapestry that has degraded and fallen out. Um, the conservator has done some close stitching using color match threads, not new silk, it's too shiny, but um, a cotton, to create the impression of the silk, but not to replace it, it's not rewoven. Um, and I think from a normal viewing distance, as I hope you can see with the other image, it, it works to, to give that lightness, to give that highlight that was part of the original um, design. Okay, so, Getting to the Coventry Tapestry in St Mary's Guildhall, it is interesting that it just has this name, the Coventry Tapestry. Many tapestries are named according to the, the image that they depict, um, whether it's religious or mythological or historical. Um, I think it's curious that it is just known as the Coventry Tapestry. Um, and unfortunately, it's, there, there is very little information about its origins and still some debate about what it actually um, depicts. And I think one of the advantages of this conservation work that's being done as part of the refurbishment of the Guildhall itself is that actually there'll be the possibility of a much closer study, including recording with really good quality images that will allow the various um, academics and historians and, and researchers who've, who've, who've been involved in its, in its interpretation and care so far to really try to get all the detail that is possible and therefore um, deepen their research into, into its possible origins. But there may not be any more information out there. However, I think this is a good opportunity to get what we can. Um, as you can see, the Guildhall is used for events, for weddings, conferences, civic events. Um, 
the building itself has always been um, a, a civic building in addition to housing um, guild related um, activities. And one of the difficulties I think is that within the space, the tapestry rather gets lost. Um, it's quite dark, it's in a darkened area. That's that certainly contributed to its preservation, keeping it out of the light, keeping it protected within a case. And it has been in, within a case for, for uh, several decades now. But it does make it difficult to see. And I think there is a feeling locally that it, it would be uh, really appreciated if, if visually it could be more accessible in some way. Um, so this is one of the, one of the aims of, of the overall project. We took the tapestry down um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the images on the left are all just us just preparing to do that. Um, we took it down using a well-established method, which is using a roller, and the picture in the top right shows that method, although obviously it's not that tapestry. Uh, we're always too busy doing the work uh, to uh, take photographs of ourselves doing the work. So it's basically rolled off the wall onto a vertically held pipe and then lower down, unrolled, re-rolled and packed up for transport. Here it is in the studio, or at least this is one third of it, left third. It's so big at three meters high and nine meters wide that I cannot open it fully in my studio because it's only seven meters wide. So I will need to look at it and document it in sections. Um, it's hoped, however, that uh, when it goes back, um, before it's finally um, sealed in a case again, that there will be the opportunity to have some really good quality photographs done. So this side of the tapestry depicts what is believed to be King Henry VI and his male courtiers behind him in the lower part. And then in the upper part, um, a whole range of male saints who can be identified often by the artifacts that they are holding. Uh, on the other side, there's, there are, is uh, what is believed to be Queen Margaret of Anjou and her ladies, and then above her, female saints. And then uh, uh, other Im images in the middle, which I'll come to shortly. The, although the tapestry is believed to have been woven in 1500, 1520, Sorry, although the, the tapestry is, is woven in that period, but is believed to depict Henry VI, the costume is not quite right for Henry VI's costume. It is right for the early 16th century date. So this is where sometimes costume can um, mislead. So in the tapestry studio, because I can light it better, because I can get really close, I can start to take some really clear images of the details of the figures. Here's a dog, for example. Here's some pictures of people's feet with this, this particular type of shoe that I think is also indicative of, of date. Uh, what I hope you can see is that the ribs of the warp are running across the width of the tapestry. So as I said, it is hung in the warp direction. Um, and you could also see in the figure of the cloak, the, the lines of color and the way in which they are intersecting each other to create what is called hatching, which was the way that weavers of that period uh, sort of transitioned from one color to another and created impressions of, of shadow in the folds of clothes uh, and, um, and to, give, to give the tapestry some depth. Uh, this was the technique that they used a lot at the time, um, as with the introduction of perspective into painting as the sort of knowledge of visual techniques changed, the tapestry weavers modified their methods too to be able to create uh, these effects in a, in a different way. Sorry, I'm just going to go back. Um, so here is a detail of um, hatching as the weaver would have seen it. So you can see the warps are running top to bottom, the ribs are running top to bottom. So this is how it would be woven. And you can see that the weaver has, has, has intersected lines of different color to create 
the shadow, the, 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 the shadows within the folds of the garments. And this is how it's actually seen when it's hanging. So it's turned on its side. Um, it would be very difficult with the tap, with the warps running top to bottom for a weaver to do a very thin line, which essentially means wrapping a wool around a single warp. And that can create lots of tension problems. You get a lot of bulk. So the, 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 the technique really uh, uh, is, is related to the, how they achieved certain visual effects. What I can also start to see is some alterations and repairs at various stages in its life. Uh, I'm not quite sure when they might happen. I might be able to correlate that with any documentation. Um, I know that some of these repairs are related to a previous conservation work. Um, sort of, we're not quite sure of the date of that. So this infill you can see on the right is, is a painted onto a, a rep weave fabric to replicate the tapestry weave uh, and to replicate the missing design. Uh, on the left hand slide there, is, there are patches that appear to have been sort of cut from one area of the tapestry and, and put into another. Um, certainly corners and bottom edges of tapestries are very, very vulnerable. They tend to hang on the floor or people stand on them or they, they get in the way. Um, so, so there is often damage at that edge. But there may also be something else going on here in terms of the tapestry changing or being changed deliberately. Um, what we are doing, what we have been doing this week is removing the lining. Uh, the tapestry was conserved by the Textile Conservation Center uh, which is where I trained, as, as Louisa mentioned, um, between 77 and, and 1980. And this lining would have been put on at that point to protect the reverse. Underneath the lining, we can see that there are many patches of different fabrics, some colored, some uncolored, which again reflect different phases of the, the care and, and conservation of this tapestry. And we are just beginning to try and work out what might have happened when, which patches belong to which period, uh, and so on, to try and create a chronology of the, of the tapestry conservation process. Unfortunately, because there are so many patches, it's actually very difficult to, to, to see the back of the tapestry clearly. Uh, there are some slightly larger areas than the one shown where there are no patches, but not very many. And it, it has been rather disappointing that we've not been able to get much more sort of clear access to the reverse, particularly in relation to how the colours have been preserved over time, uh, but also to see more detail about alterations that have, that have occurred. One such alteration relates to the figure in at the top centre of the tapestry, which is now the figure of justice but uh, replaces something else. And that has been the discussion, uh, been the basis of a lot of discussion over the years amongst um, tapestry uh, historians and, and uh, historians of Coventry. But I can see a difference when I actually come close to it in terms of the quality of the weaving. So as I'm on removing the, the lining, I'm rolling the tapestry and I can see the front of the tapestry. And in the bottom left picture, I can see that there's a difference in quality just at that point where this uh, replacement figure is in. And as I look closer, I can see that the original tapestry, the, the weaving was coarser than in the replacement panel. So there are fewer warps per inch in the original than there are in the later edition. And that, you know, that may be a useful piece of information in terms of identifying when and where it might have been done. It's also just very nice when you're doing conservation to be able to sort of get really close and look at some of the faces. There's a huge amount of character in, in the way that the people have been depicted. Um, there's also some quirky elements. Uh, hands are quite difficult for tapestry weavers. If you imagine you were just weaving up from the bottom to top, you can't go back and, and tweak it. So if you inadvertently started the fingers too soon on the hand, you can't really go back and, and undo it. Uh, faces, uh, again, can be quite tricky, but on these, they've, they've put in a lot of detail. Animals, particularly exotic animals, very often have human faces. They, the weavers probably have never seen a, a lion in their, in their life and are just taking um, image from a, an illustration. 
we can also start to maybe compare um, some of the details with perhaps information that's been out there about the tapestry uh, for many years that may be wrong or misleading, or in fact may help us um, understand the design of the tapestry because they have the, they're clearer, crisper. So the two things can, can work together to really help us gather as much information as possible. So this is the book that is in front of the um, Henry VI, uh, as shown in an illustration. Um, I'm not sure the date of that, I'm afraid. And then obviously we're also looking at condition. So on the left is a picture of the front of a, a column, which is a green color, and then the same area from the back where you can see that the green is stronger, uh, a stronger color, as is the, the red brown behind it. So the colors have been, have been preserved to a certain extent on the back. There isn't a huge difference between, between the two, which I think shows how well the tapestry has been cared for over its time. And then we are also, as I say, documenting the conservation work that we've done before to see if it's still fit for purpose, uh, to see if there's any additional work needed. And this is an example of some of the brick couching that had been done um, in the past at the Textile Conservation Centre. Um, and it really is, has, has survived the 40 years extremely well. And I think there will only be a minor amount of additional work that we may have to do. So it's sort of adding to the story of the textile, I think, in bringing in the, the conservation history. Uh, finally, I want to just uh, show a few images of uh, something that has come up in the research, and that's about uh, who this figure is and why the item that he is holding seems to have been darned out. And you can really see the darning, this blue stitching, over whatever it was. It was thought to be maybe a serpent reflecting some deceit. Um, it could be even a, a chain of office. Uh, you can see the king wearing a chain of office. Perhaps this is a person who wanted that chain of office or had that chain of office. Anyway, uh, it, it's not my area of research, but I just wanted to um, uh, show the images. And because we are so close, we will really be able to look at those uh, repairs and alterations and try to understand what they mean. Finally, uh, as I say, we only just started this week, so only half of the tapestry has been opened on the front and we are documenting as much as, as we can. We are very much looking forward to opening out the whole of it eventually and being able to look really closely at all these, all these beautiful details and to be able to pass that information on uh, to Coventry City Council and the other individuals involved in the research and interpretation of this tapestry. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Alison. Yes, if you'd like to stop sharing, amazing. Um, so now is the opportunity um, to ask um, Alison whatever questions you might have. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with Zoom, if you'd like to ask a question, you can use the raise hand function, which you should find in the little box saying reactions at the bottom of your screen. So while everyone's finding that, I see that Rembrandt has a question. So Rembrandt, would you like to start? Uh, yes, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Alison, for, for a really wonderful uh, overview of, of uh, text, you know, tapestry res restoration in general, and then the, 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 the Coventry tapestry in, in particular. Um, one of the things I found interesting in, in your presentation was you clearly deal with materials. Uh, well, you, in the beginning, you put the Sutherland tapestry next to the old guild hall tapestry, 450 years apart. So the, 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 they are from, from very different times. And I was wondering if that also requires sort of different specialisms. Um, uh, another question that I had was um, in. Uh, in painting restoration, which I know more of, uh, you can see that over time there are very different uh, styles of restoration. Uh, often you can even uh, recognize periods when paintings have been restored from the way in which they have been restored, whether more uh, more paint have been more more varnish has been scraped off or or uh, not, for instance. Um, and sometimes you can recognize specific styles of specific museums. Uh, would you say that you, you, there are 
similar sort of evolving approaches in textile restoration? Um, yes, absolutely. So to answer your first question, um, there are similarities and differences between um, the, the historic tapestry and modern tapestry or historic any textile and a modern any textile. Um, ab, in many ways, they are very similar because they are made of the same materials um, combined in the same way. And often the difference is, is in the design rather than in the actual composition. But it is true that with modern textiles, including tapestries, the weavers are really experimenting with unconventional, non-traditional materials and techniques, just as they are in other forms yeah. of, of fine art. And I do think tapestry does come into the fine art category. So, so yes, yeah, so, so first of all, there are, for the conservator, there are the same problems, plus some problems that are unfamiliar because of this unconventional use of materials and techniques. And that we haven't been able to yet fully understand how those materials deteriorate over time or how the interaction between the, the traditional conventional materials and methods that we do know uh, and the modern materials creates a whole new set of um, issues that is different from either. Um, so, so yes, there, there are differences. I think our approach is essentially the same about understanding the object, finding out about what those materials and techniques are, and getting to grips with the nature of the object, how it should look, how it should behave, and the deterioration, and then putting all that information together to come up with an appropriate um, strategy. I suppose we are perhaps looking more outside our own discipline towards other disciplines with these modern artifacts because they do bring in uh, uh, ma materials and, and structures that we are less familiar with, um, paints and non-textile materials, uh, paper, leather, ceramics, whatever it is, you know, there's the, the, it's, it's really bringing all these materials together as, as is typical in, in contemporary art. Uh, the second question is, yes, there is also very recognizable kind of phases within the conservation uh, in terms of techniques. So, Looking at the back of this tapestry, I can see that there are lots of patches and that, that through which conservation stitching has been worked and, and it's very effective. But I think these days we would probably apply a, a full backing of the new support fabric rather than lots of individual patches where there are perhaps gaps in between that um, maybe are not having the same amount of support. And I think it's, it's all just, as you said, about evolving methodology and learning from previous treatments and so this this uh, this project is really allowing us to revisit and I hope I hope to do that with the actual we uh, conservators involved in the original conservation to revisit at least that 19 uh, late 1970s treatment and and really kind of reflect on uh, decisions were made and, and how we can use that going forward. Um, 